Hello, friends. Hi. Welcome to Montessori 101, <laughs> a live show from Child of the Redwoods, all about the magic of Montessori. We believe that every child deserves a Montessori education. I'm Aubrey Hargis. And I'm David Hargis. So whether you are live, hello out there, thank you for joining us. Or maybe you're just watching the replay. That's also great. I see Wendy is here. Oh, yeah. Too yeah. famous in that yeah. Jeep, Daniela. Yes, right? it is. Um, or maybe you're listening to the podcast. That's okay as well. Mm -hmm. We're just happy you are with us. And if you want to know more about our work, you can visit us online at childoftheredwoods.com or look at one of the many, many videos. I mean, I think our library has gotten pretty large here. Yeah. We've covered a lot of topics. Yes. Um, so if you are brand new to Montessori and you want to learn more Montessori, um, of course, join us for a course at Child of the Redwoods. Um, but also, there is a pretty, pretty wealthy library here on our YouTube channel. That's so, right. So um, we are trying to organize them by playlist for you. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you've got them pretty much organized by playlist, right? There's like so, an essentials yeah. playlist yeah, right. and an awesome lessons playlist. Yeah. Those would both be really great places to start. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, today. We're not doing an awesome lesson per se, but we are talking about an awesome lesson concept. Yes. That Wendy has already uh, kind of tipped her hat toward, right? Ooh. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the noticing my new haircut. Yes. I noticed it was sticking up a little bit. That's but an that's Aubrey okay. original. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's fine. When I, you know, I've lost enough hair at this point that I don't think it's worth paying somebody to cut it. And you do such a good job anyway. I've been cutting your hair for like years. Okay. Well, I've been losing my hair for years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, but you do a great job. You yeah. So job. speaking of, now that is a really practical life skill. I know every child tries to cut their own hair while we're off topic a little bit, um, but also talking about movement. That's true. Um, yeah, I don't know a single child. <laughs> I don't know a single child who has not tried to cut their own hair. And honestly, like it, I, I think it freaks a lot of parents out the first time their child does it. Like we're all kind of embarrassed, like, oh, they cut their hair. Um, but I'm going to just throw this idea out. Like, why aren't we teaching them how to cut their own hair? I mean, obviously we think scissors are dangerous and it is close to their head. Yes, but they do it anyway. Mm. Um, and it is a really practical skill. Yeah. I'm just throwing that sure. one out there. Yeah. Just, just food for thought. Food for thought. Yes. Um, so movement. So today we are talking about movement. We are going to feature a lesson from Symphony. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to have Symphony over here? Let's see. Mm -hmm. I know we printed it recently. You might have to go rummage Rummage, go rummage around on the other side. You'll find it. You'll find it. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we are featuring a lesson from the unit Symphony as an example of a way that you can make movement um, fun. Just do a fun activity at home that really incorporates movement and also teaches a very valuable lesson about music. Yeah. Um, but just more in general, movement is a core part of the Montessori method? I'd say it's a core part of all the life experience, right? The mind-body connection is a real thing. And um, it comes out in all sorts of ways in our life, including through our learning. And when we have kids, you know, I, unfortunately, we still do this. We have them sit for long periods of time at desks. Uh, it's not just that the uniformity is sort of soul crushing. It's also just like you're not l allowing a, the child to use the, all of their senses and all of their um, skills at learning, all the tools that we've evolved to have to learn when we have them just sit. And so when we use movement what it, in any of our lessons, is, and you can really work it into most anything, uh, then uh, you, you're really not only – um, kind of getting out the wiggles, but you're also helping draw a tighter connection because the mind-body connection is a real thing. That's true. It is actually something that we know a lot more about now. That yeah, that's right. We have um, continued to do studies about the mind-body connection, but it actually was a pretty revolutionary idea it for was. Maria Montessori in her time. At that time, you know, the, the regular 
condition of a schoolroom was children sitting at little desks copying from a blackboard. Um, and maybe some of you grew up in that kind of a that kind of an educational I approach. I think you'll too. find that still around. It is still it is still around the world. Um, but Maria Montessori noticed that, um, children were just getting in trouble for moving their bodies. And I think she had this instinctual feeling that something was amiss that like it, you know, if you really, truly deeply respected the child, uh, you would be catering to them rather than trying to constantly fix them. And even today, I don't know how many times you yourself have gone to, I don't know, to a library event or, you know, to any kind of children gathering, teaching event where the presenter, the teacher you know, instructs children, crisscross applesauce, you know, make your bodies very, very still, you know, because if you do have a whole bunch of wiggling children, you mm -hmm. know, this is from a practical standpoint, is someone who has taught many large groups of children <laughs> over the years. If you have a large group of children there and they are not in control of their bodies, things can go south really, really quickly. Um, movement is contagious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's not just like the little arm bumps, mm -hmm. you know, but like, you notice one kid bumps their arm against another kid and then what, what happens? Like that child <laughs> literally flops over on the oh. next one. Uh, and then pretty soon, like half of the class is like all falling over each other and it's just chaos and your lesson is gone. I mean, so there is a practical reason for teaching children how to have body control. control. Body control. Sure. But Maria Montessori felt like it was not to the children's advantage to be constantly made to sit still. She noticed that little children especially just have this immense drive to move mm -hmm. and that when we allow that movement to happen and in fact encourage that movement to happen, their learning actually increased. Yep. So uh, a classic example of this is, you know, that we can think of as a, a real literal lesson, mm -hmm. you know, that where you could measure, you know, the, the results and see if it was effective or not would be like the sandpaper letters. Yeah. That's so a, good one. Uh, a child who is lo maybe looking at a, uh, a board and just like being shown the letter A, you know, like that does a spark, you know, you can memorize, everyone knows you can memorize things with flashcards, right? It's, you can't. Yep. All right. Some you are better. Some can memorize them faster than others, but, yeah, but road memorization. Pretty works. much everybody can memorize things when like drilled with flashcards. Like, yep. I mean, it is, it, it does work. But Maria Montessori noticed that it works so much better when children aren't just flashed the letter A, but instead they trace, you know, that letter. Uh, That's it's right. probably backwards on the screen for you. Well, uh, but yeah. yeah, when they like, when they actually incorporate some hand movement, like the, the memory increases, like it, the, the quickness of the way the child is able to learn those letters just it's manifold. Yeah. You know, it's interesting as you're talking about this, because I, mm. I always think about this in context of context of the planes of development, right? So the child under six is in a sensorial period. And so we literalize things as much as possible because abstract thinking is harder for them. And so when we have them trace the sandpaper letters, it makes literal something that is by nature symbolic and abstract, which mm -hmm. is a lot a character. But it, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about the mind-body connection that we now really do understand. Although, how many of us have heard somebody say, oh, it's just all in your head? Or you have mm. told yourself it's all in your head. Yeah. Nowadays, what we, you know, what we know now is that um, that it's, doesn't... It's not all in your head, right? <laughs> even if it is all in your head, you might still be sick or you might still feel pain or you might mm. still be whatever, right? Because your mind and your body are so intricately tied together. And so it isn't just... I. It's interesting now that I think about it that it is definitely about the journey to abstraction that you have in the second plane and how you're using the sensorial experience for the younger children. But it's also just something that we maintain through the entirety of our life. And we're kind of uncomfortable with it, I mm. think, in our in Western society at least, or have been for several generations now, it feels like, but now we're starting to kind of come to terms with this idea that 
what you manifest in your mind actually can affect the physical world mm -hmm. in one way or the other. I mean, this is the essence of like the placebo effect or others. This isn't just like mm -hmm. woo woo stuff. This is actually how the brain and the body work together. Yeah. And so Maria's observation was really cutting edge. It was. Uh, to have this kind of aha moment. Uh, but of course, it's worth noting that even today we still don't do that. I mean, we, I was thinking about your thing about the blackboard, like we, it's very, you don't find that very common, commonly here in the US at least, of a child sitting in rows and copying off a blackboard. Um, but what you do see all the time. You saw a lot more of it 20 years ago. You did. But what you Even definitely see States. today is a child on a tablet or a smartphone tracing a finger. And there is some tactile experience there with the finger on mm -hmm. it, but it's not, that's not movement. That is right. the 21st century version of copying off a blackboard. That's right. Which is, I mean, again, uh, it can work. You can learn, you can memorize things. Whether or not that's learning is another question, but you can acquire knowledge. And uh, it's not all harmful. I wouldn't say like, never give your child a tablet, but just know what you're doing. Like, it's not going to do the same if you want your child to learn it's a not concept. Encouraging you got to get them to move. The, it's not encouraging the kind of movement that we really know impacts learning. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, Wendy actually brought up, she said, I would like to know some tips to incorporate more of this into our daily routine. Oh, so something, here's a, a Montessori secret mm -hmm. that um, not a whole lot of people think about when they think about the Montessori method. What do you think about when you think about the Montessori method? You think about the shelves, oh, sure. right? The you materials. Think about, and the you think, oh, following movement, the child. child is working on the floor, maybe instead of at a desk. Yep. All that is good. But here is a secret um, technique that Montessori guides actually use in the classroom that you might not notice. Um, and that is Maria Montessori taught her trained guides to actually make things less convenient for the child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, when we think about in order to encourage more mm, movement, so when we think about creating an environment for our children, and this is not to say that we don't want to make the environment accessible to our children, like definitely bring things down to their level um, and make sure that, that they actually can access yeah, child things. Child-sized right. things yeah. or whatever. But uh, consider like... If you have, I don't know, a rug or a desk and like everything the child needs is like right in front of them. Or if you're constantly bringing to the child everything that they need so that they will like stay there in one place and have. And it might be with the best intention that like you bring everything to the child into the, the same room, maybe or the same area. And you're thinking this will be more convenient and it will encourage the child to not have to run around and find everything that they need. Um, but actually one of the tricks is to intentionally put some things in an area that's less convenient for mm -hmm. the children so mm -hmm. that they will literally have to get up, move across the room and go get it. And one example, a great example of this would be like the pink tower. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe one day, Wendy, like keep a sensorial material or like put a, a sensorial material in a room where it doesn't normally belong, you know, where it's like a little less convenient. Maybe you put it in the hallway or maybe you put it um, in the kitchen. I don't know. Maybe put it on the kitchen counter one time, put it in a place where it's less convenient for the child, um, a place where the child wouldn't be working at it. And then that will encourage them to have to wind their way back through the house to go get the next material mm -hmm. and then wind their way back into the room where they're working. And that's, yeah. you know, that is, I know it sounds kind of silly when we think about like a sensorial material on the counter, but this is actually a technique that Maria Montessori used to use in her classroom. Yeah. She would put something that the child needed on one side of the classroom and, and then actually instruct the child. She would intentionally sit on the other side of the classroom to play a game for, with a material that was like, on a shelf that she could have set her chair next to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yeah, she would play a game. Right. She would say, okay, like say we're going to play a game with like these golden beads and colored beads. All yeah. right. And so it would feel natural to want to play the bring me game at your, like at the rug, like bring your stuff to the rug. And then you would tell your child, like, can you find the three bead and bring me, you know, give me the three bead. Mm -hmm. And your child can do that. But I mean, how much movement does it take? Like you said, they pick it out and then they like give it to you and you're right there. But what if 
what if this was like across the room, <laughs> yeah. across the room somewhere um, where your child had to like physically get up, run to the shelf or, you know, skip or whatever they do to the shelf. <laughs> you could even make that fun. I'm imagining a, a child slithering to the shelf. Like, could you slither to the shelf yeah. and bring me a four? Could you slither to the shelf and, and bring me I don't know. We just got a connection warning. So Hopefully we're tell still us, connected. yeah, tell us in the chat if you can still hear and, and see us. I would appreciate that, Wendy and Daniela. And we'll we'll wait for that. All right. Hopefully. Hopefully it's still, still working. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> you can see like how you might be able to look at like the lesson that you're doing and be thinking, is there something that Thanks, I could Wendy. do? Oh, good. Good. We're still on. Um, is there something that we could do to encourage like to make this a little less convenient to encourage a little more um a little more moving around so yeah back to like skip on over to the shelf and bring me a four yep. slither on over to the shelf and bring me the five you yep. know i mean how much more fun is that than just like you know which one is the five which you know which is the six give me the six give mm -hmm. me the seven like you could do that but it's much more fun if there's more yeah. movement, like bigger movement involved. Yeah. And there's, a, you know, that's uh, on top of the kind of classic lessons that already involve a lot of movement. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of um, there's a, in, in, I think it's in practical life where uh, you use tweezers to move small objects and uh, you start by teaching the child to distribute them in from one bowl to another but then in a later step you're going to have them uh, or in a later version of the lesson as they get older you're going to have them grab the bead with the tweezers and then move to another spot and put those in the in the little container or you might have them walk on the line and then later you might have them walk on the line with something fragile like uh, two blocks stacked on each other or something that they have to kind of carry then you're having that movement so, so these are lessons that are in the standard curriculum yes that use movement. But then what you're describing is like taking those concepts and then applying to other things like go get me the whatever, the, go, go get me the golden bead. Mm -hmm. um, so what is so great about movement? So let's just kind of run through some of the benefits real quick. And then we're going to show you a fun lesson that you can do at home. So memory, developing memory mm -hmm. in your muscles, something that we know is a benefit of movement. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So when movements are repeated, they become automatic. And when they become automatic, whatever it is, making your coffee every morning, you can your mind can be thinking about things mm -hmm. other than the thing that your body is doing. And uh, there is benefit to making your focused attention on the thing that you are moving, of mm -hmm. course. But also, um, it's a biological benefit to us to have muscle memory developed, you know, for these really rote things, yeah. handwriting, you know, I mean, how much, how much easier is it to just like, think you know think about what you want to say rather than trying to think about how the letters are formed yeah i mean it's so a, you know you would argue it's arguable that actually um if we hadn't if we didn't have the skill of muscle memory we probably would not have uh, developed things like handwriting it just would have been too cumbersome if you have to remember the motion the precise motion of every time to make a um a, a certain character um yeah, I see somebody's having a, uh, Danielle, you're having a bit of trouble with the connection. Hopefully, nothing. I mean, hopefully, we'll come back if we are. Well, our teenager removed the hard wire that I used to plug in during our live. So we'll address that later. Hopefully, mm. this will still record for you. But what about his trouble. server? <laughs> <laughs> I know. He was moving around down here. Talking about movement. Mm. That's right. Okay. So, yeah. So, muscle memory is very helpful to us as humans. Our children are repeating yep. things. Maria Montessori knew that the repetition was super important to develop that muscle memory so that children could, you know, grow their brains and actually start really thinking about other things other than like these little rote things. Yeah. And the more they practice them and the children now have this natural drive to practice things, uh, the more it becomes part of their muscle memory, the mm -hmm. better, more proficient they get at it. And the more they're able to, 
to expand their abstract learning, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we also know that movement has dramatic impacts on a person's cognition. Yep. A lot of studies are being done with patients who have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, that sort of thing. Yep. And we know that when those people go out and exercise, even if it's just like for a walk every single day, we know that like their prefrontal cortexes and their hippocampus or whatever are like getting stronger and they actually do have visible stronger memory retention, yep. um, you know, for knowledge. It actually literally helps us at all, all yep. ages of life. So it's not just something for young children, but also there are many studies about young children showing that when you incorporate movement, uh, you just see these considerable cognitive benefits. Yeah, that's but an example of the mind-body connection. It is, but it's not. You know, this is not something that you need to become experts on, friends. Like, you don't need to go and uh, read the research to know that movement helps children. All you have to do is really just channel your inner Mon Ma Maria Montessori and observe your child, and it'll be very, very obvious that when they are moving, they are more joyful and they're mm -hmm. happier, and they are in. They're gaining more control over their bodies. Yep. I mean, it just is super, super beneficial. And also you mentioned processing emotions. Yep. So movement, uh, any kind of mindful movement, controlled body movement, whether it's aerobic exercise or like a, you know, kind of a, a calm walk, walking on the line, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, like Montessori type of mindfulness exercise, um, all of those help your child to release their emotions and to process their emotions. Um, it's, it's really, really important for all of us to move in order to become less stressed. It helps your child find their calm. Yeah. And so uh, people think that, you know, when we've got a big classroom full of little children who are constantly wiggling mm -hmm. or even just two little children or one little child at home, who's not listening to your lessons and is like wiggling and wiggling and doesn't seem to pay attention. The, the big takeaway that we can, that we can gather from this is that the more movement we incorporate into mm -hmm. our children's activities, actually the more focused attention we're going to see. Mm -hmm. So we have this, I think that we have this instinct that when our children are unfocused and inattentive and uh, extra wiggly, we want to like make them be more focused and more attentive by making them be still. Right. <laughs> we have this like, we think that this is the solution. And what Montessori teaches us is actually it's the opposite. The more movement you incorporate into those lessons, the more focused attention you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And if you, the more movement you incorporate, the more focused attention you're going to see both in the, in the moment and in the long term. Yeah, I would add to that, and you tell me what you think here, that yeah. the emphasis, it is on movement, it's often on controlled movement, purposeful movement. So it's not just having the wiggles, it's recognizing that the child wants to use his body as part of the learning process. And so, you know, gonna, you why not incorporate that tendency into it? But a lot of the Montessori lessons are about learning sort of a controlled, uh, uh, purposeful movement. And uh, that can be very, very satisfying to a child as it is to an adult. Correct. All right. <laughs> So I actually see that um, we forgot to turn our chat request off. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to hop over and just tell this sweet person who is on right now that um, we will be offline. You got to catch five us minutes. live yeah. right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so would you introduce the, yeah. the lesson while I'm just, I'm just going to type that real fast. That's right. So anyway, yeah, you know, uh, as we've been talking, I was thinking, the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, there's a lot of new studies now that talk about how mental health can be uh, helped uh, uh, through movement. And we know, it, at least in some cases, I don't uh, that um, depression, anxiety, things like that can be um, treated or if not completely treated, but uh, helped. Uh, the symptoms can be helped through movement, exercise, you know, getting the endorphins going, moving the body. So it's a wonderful time to live, right? As we study more and more about uh, how our mind works, we begin to see all these other connections. Like if uh, if you are sedentary, it actually can affect your mood in a, uh, in a real way. And if you're feeling uh, tense or you're having some depression, then movement can be an, an important component of a regimen, of treatment. 
as an, you know, as an adult. So that mind body connection, the wiggles that the little ones have it, that continues all throughout. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So let's, we see. did a lesson, uh, in, uh, when this was in December. Oh yes. So I'm going to show you the cards and do you want to cut them? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So in December, uh, we did a symphony, uh, and it's actually in the store now. If you're not a member of constellation and you're interested in studying the symphony, it's also an um, example of how you can, um, how you can make these materials so quickly at home Yes, just with a printer. And um, also just that you don't have to be fussy with them. No. I think a lot of people think that it takes a lot of time to prepare for these Montessori lessons with printables. And it actually doesn't have to. Yeah, uh, It depends on your attention to detail. If you're going to be like really fussy about all your cards and want them all laminated and everything before you present it to your child, then for sure. But you literally can just like, print things out, cut them up, and then teach your child the moment too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and the quality of the of the material itself matters. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, this is an example of how uh, of a lesson that incorporates several different concepts. So this lesson was a is about teaching uh, beats per minute because it goes with symphony. So it's an art. Uh, there's a lot about the arts in there, as you would imagine. Uh, but because it's a thematic approach, which is what we really recommend above all else, uh, we want to incorporate all the other or as many of the other subjects and concepts into the study as possible. So this is an example of how uh, we chose to do it. And the idea would be maybe as you're looking at this example, you might start to creatively think how you might replicate something similar. So there are actually... Three different ways that this, I was thinking, uh, it's, you told yeah. me if I'm wrong, there's actually okay. at least three different lessons, maybe four. So there is, you've already? You mean in this one activity? In this one activity. Do you want to, did you pull it open in the? No, I'll show you. No. Would you get that open for us in Symphony? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can find these in our Constellation theme, Symphony. I'm almost done. Yeah, See? so. It's like taking me, I don't know. Three minutes yeah. to just whip these little materials up. So the way the cards work is that on one side you have a, uh, an image, you have a, a phrase. This one says, you are a giant tortoise moving one foot at a time. And then on the back, it has uh, the beats per minute. So this is free. Set your metronome. So it gives the uh, vocabulary. So Largo, Andante, Adagio. Uh, and this one says, set your metronome to 40 beats per minute. So we that is the essential thing, right? You're going to read one side of the card, and then you're going to act it out. So that's one part. You've got the movement. Now you're acting like a tortoise. And then you're going to turn it over, and you're going to learn the vocabulary word. In this case, uh, it was a grave. And... Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, and you, then you could use a metronome to have them move 40 beats, which is a minute, which is pretty slow, like a tortoise. So you're having them move their body, think about what that represents, and uh, making that connection, right? So this is, again, an example. So one of the things that you're doing with these kinds of cards is you're teaching vocabulary, right? Another thing that you're doing with these kinds of cards is you're introducing... Um, uh, at least in this case, you're introducing how a metronome works and what it's 40 beats per minute sounds like, or in this case, our cheetah, uh, which is our fastest animal, uh, which goes 200 beats per minute, right? So that's very fast. Da, 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 da. And it can be very exciting, right? That you imagine your child's like, oh, no, I'm going, I'm quick, I'm, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. Very different than, uh, let's say, oh, let's see, no, oh, our puppy. Yeah. Puppies are pretty fast, right? Andante, 95 beats per minute. Here's our little dog. It says, you are a dog taking a walk with your favorite human. And that's Andante. Uh, so again, you've, you're teaching, you've got reading. Now you've got vocabulary. And this one says the dog goes 95 beats per minute. So pretty fast compared to that tortoise, but not nearly as fast as that cheetah. Okay, so those are a few of the things that you would be doing. Now, another thing that you would do with these cards is that you would have the child order them from slowest to fastest or fastest to slowest, depending, I guess, and looking at and then using the back with the the, um, the time signature or the, the beats per minute to as a control of error to kind of know whether they got the answer correctly. Mm -hmm. So is an elephant faster or a puppy, right? Well, in this case, it's the, the puppy, 
The puppy goes <laughs> faster. It's 95 and adagio for our elephant is 70 beats. And you mm -hmm. could add in another element. I mean, how many songs are called adagio uh, or examples of adagio, which is a type of, you know, sort of a, a romantic feeling, I feel like, kind of move to music. Uh, playing that on a piece, an, an adagio piece, while your child is walking like an elephant. Uh, and so now you're bringing in music, and they're having the sensorial experience of movement. They're hearing the movement, uh, the music. They're acting out the movement. They're thinking about how an elephant moves in comparison to other animals. And they're thinking about this vocabulary word, which is adagio. So this is where movement, which is the centerpiece of this whole activity, right? The cards are fun and putting them in order is fun. But the, the thing that's really, really fun about it is the movement. Now I'm an elephant. Now I'm a puppy. Now I'm a cheetah. Now I'm a, a fox. Okay? And uh, that kind of imaginative play, tying it to these more complex concepts. I mean, a concept for like Adagio or Largo or something. We like could that. actually do a whole episode on hard. how to integrate in pretend play to these Montessori lessons because that is that is so fun. It is. Yeah, I mean, children love it, and uh, it entices them to the activity. I think more. Um, so I'm sorry I didn't give you more direction. You flip to where our cards are included in the yeah. packet, um, but I I want to show our friends what the lesson actually looks like inside the a little peek inside the symphony theme for those who are considering because we just uh released this to our store yeah that's right? right yeah so it's actually available not just for constellation members but you can actually download this right now um from our website if you go to our shop mm -hmm. so inside this is what the lettuce the lesson actually looks like um so i'll read this this says music animal tempo music can be played slowly or quickly or at a moderate pace. It can also be played very, very, very slowly or very, very, very quickly. In this activity, you will help your child explore the speed of music by pretending to be an animal. You'll end up doing a bit of math too. And we actually have categorized this, although we could probably categorize this lesson under different subject areas, but we categorized it under math um, because we were well, dealing number with numbers. And, yeah. Yes. And did you talk about how a lot of our members like actually connected the golden beads? No. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, some of our members who did this activity in Constellation got out their golden beads or their colored beads and they actually made the numbers that went along with yeah. these. I mean, that would be really fun, right? This is a, so fun. This is our gazelle and it's 165 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. That would be a pretty long chain, wouldn't it, compared to uh, this rabbit, which, you know, we know rabbits are fast, the tortoise and the hare, but it's only 108. So that's another way to kind of visualize the mathematical concept. Right. And the physical activity would be lining up the beads. Um, so then also in this packet, you know, you can see like the only materials that you need for this particular lesson to uh, come off in your home successfully is a metronome app. So we are integrating some technology. We're not anti technology in Montessori. I get that question a lot, actually. Like, are you anti technology like the Waldorf people? The answer is no, we are not. But, um, we want to make sure it's well placed and it doesn't replace anything that the child could be doing themselves or a hands-on experience. Um, so a metronome app is really easy to find. You yeah. could find that right now on your phone. Just type it in metronome app. Um, what I like to do also is just go to Google mm -hmm. and just type in um, the, the 108 speed. Beats yeah. per minute. Well, 108 beats per minute enter and it, it should give you a little, or maybe even metronome 180. Mm -hmm. And it'll like pop up. Google has a metronome. And so you don't even need an app mm -hmm. in order to do it. You just need the internet. So very, very cool. And then it just like gives you the beat. Yep. Now, if you want to go old school, they they still do sell old school metronomes. And those are really fun. They are really fun. I have fond memories of my metronomes from when I was a kid mm -hmm. learning how to play piano. And you watch it go back and forth. Tick, talk, tick. Talk. It's yep. like a lesson in physical science as well. Right. Um, so feel free to, to go in that direction if you want to be completely hands-on. And then we tell you how to set up the lessons, which is pretty easy. An example of the cards in here. It's something that we added to um, our theme or like David started putting in actual examples of the cards. And yeah. they're also scripted. So this is an example.
example, you know exactly what to say. Um, some of our members like to keep this next to them, you know, while they're giving the lesson so that they can kind of read and then yep. instruct and then read and instruct. And it saves a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, this is written not the way just any old teacher would give these lessons, but in the style of a classic Montessori lesson. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to know how would, um, you know, you might find this activity on the Internet, but the way you present it could be different as a Montessorian. And so if you want to know how would a Montessori teacher present this, you know, what is one way that a mm -hmm. Montessori guide would be inclined to, then this is how we have scripted it for you. Some of our members do not like to have the book next to them. Instead, they like to read through all of the scripting ahead of time yep. and then use their own words, you know, to, to chat with their child about it. And that's good, too. The point is that it's just really helpful to have, you know, to have some, you know, to have a guide yeah. um, to kind of help you get oriented. It helps you really quickly get oriented to how to give the lesson. And then you're ready to just go and, and get it. And we even give you little examples of where to put these things, you know, how to display them on a rug mm -hmm. um, when it's appropriate to, to tell you so. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, this is a great example of where, you know, as much as we like our materials um, and I like my little box drawing or whatever, but it's the method that matters. Yeah. Like as Maria teaches us herself, the methodology, it's, it's the lesson uh, philosophy and method that matters. Yep. Uh, so that's where like this idea of like, you can go through the scripting and you can read it verbatim if you wish, or you can do that for a while. And then you can get to the point where you feel real confident with it because once you start to internalize the rhythm of how Montessori lessons work, you'll start to see how similar many of them are. Mm -hmm. And then you've started to truly get the philosophy in, and then you can start to be creative. Like, yeah. for example, we hadn't thought of the golden using the golden beads mm -hmm. with, with this. this. Yeah, it's not but, listed in here, but our members, yeah. um, you know, we, we do use that technique a lot in Constellation. And so our members are starting to like, oh, automatically yes, right. include the golden beads as an extension to a lot of these activities. And it would depend awesome. on the age of the yeah. child, too. So that would also go to the yeah. idea of like understanding the theory behind it. Um, the last thing I want to kind of show off is this everyone can play section. A lot of people are mistakenly under the assumption that lessons, certain activities or lessons are only for certain ages. Mm -hmm. Now, something like if you haven't even introduced the golden beads to your child, you know, to your little toddler yet, of course, like they're going to have trouble making that abstract leak. But most activities can be easily adapted to little ones or to older kids. And so if you're thinking about this activity and you're thinking, yeah, but my kid is, you know, an older elementary child or something like, what would I do? We actually have a, a part down here that says, hey, you got a lower elementary kid. Um, how about you translate the tempo words from Italian into English? And that would extend this activity, make it a little bit harder and maybe some more interesting for your elementary child. Yeah, because that's definitely part of the grammar mm -hmm. um, curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Um, and just learning languages is really good definitely. for really good for kids, um, for everyone, but also really good for kids. Um, and say you have a, a primary age child. I know a lot of people who are probably taking this course are in our primary course mm -hmm. right now. So what could you do as an extension or what little tips do we have for primary children? In here, we have encourage your primary child to use their imagination and get into the pretend play part, all right? Like emphasize that part. Yeah. Really get into it, you know, and bark like a puppy at the, mm -hmm. you know, at the, the tempo and, you know, really hop like a rabbit mm -hmm. um, during the, the tempo where the yep. rabbit is hopping. And for your toddlers, we just say skip the parts about the beads. Like just show your child the cards with the animals um, maybe don't even worry about, you know, the beats per, per measure, just enjoy pretending to be each animal and encourage your child to, to walk as slow as they think an Ew, elephant I'm would walk, like walk elephant. or as fast as I'm a cheetah like a... would walk. It helps if you're doing an activity like this, it helps to, this would be so fun on a playground too. Wouldn't it? it would be a lot of fun outside. You're it right. would. Cause then you could run really, really fast. Yeah. I was going to say it helps. Okay. I want to, yeah that aside um it helps to give your child some boundaries for the lesson too yes like uh if you are worried about you know your child you don't want them running like a cheetah 
I don't know, your grandma's house or something, you don't want them running through the, like a cheetah through the dining room, then give them a boundary, you know, yeah. say like, uh, we're going to, we're going to stay on this rug, like run mm -hmm. like a cheetah, but you know, we're going to stay on the rug to do, to do this activity. Yeah. We're not going to go off the rug, you know? Um, and if you're outside, then maybe give them a certain point, like run like a cheetah to the fence and then back, you know, or uh, move like an elephant to the fence and back. Yep. And maybe you do fewer animals because your child will get tired, but it's also going to going to become part of their muscle mm -hmm. memory and it's fun and you are still learning about tempo you're learning about totally. fast and slow and the moderate speeds yeah, and there know, are nine so. in, in our example we have nine cards and you know you to your point about doling them out a little bit you might start with just three at a time or and then slowly add especially as the child is learning it uh, or if they're younger and uh, you want them to be able to focus in on a certain number yeah. All Thank right. you, Danielle. That's very nice of you. I'm yes. glad it's helpful and that the visuals and the scripts are helpful. That's really, yes. really nice to hear. So those of you in Constellation, I hope you go back and revisit that activity. Yeah, if you if didn't you, do this one yet. If you missed it or if your child enjoyed it and you just haven't done it in a while. This is something that is fun to go back and do again and again. Yeah, it could sit on keep, the shelf. Keep it in a little basket on the shelf and play it anytime you want. Um, and if you are brand new to us and you're curious about Constellation, go try out a theme. There, yep. there are tons of themes available in our shop. Um, go purchase one, try it out, download it, and then uh, make a decision about whether this is something you'd like to do with us moving forward. And put movement into every lesson. Yes, well, <laughs> as many lessons as, as you many can, lessons as right? you can. Maybe not for like quiet the quiet game, right? The silence, right? The silent game. <laughs> Where you're like listening, maybe you don't want to be wiggling for the side. In our game. community, some of our members were talking about like that. What is it like? Thumbs up, yeah. seven up. First, do you remember playing that as a kid? Yes. Where like we were talking about the silent game, um, which is a thing in Montessori, and they were like, "This reminds me of thumbs up, seven up." And I was yeah. thinking, yeah, okay. I was thinking, oh, like that's actually like something teachers would try to do to make sure everybody was super calm. That's right? the quiet game. But also. That's different than the silence game. No, no, seven, <laughs> you don't remember seven thumbs up, seven up? No, I was thinking about things that we parents or teachers tell kids to do. Play the to, quiet game. To play quiet. But. <laughs> that's different than the silence The game. unintended benefit of that. <laughs> but the unintended benefit of this is that they do learn to appreciate the silence. And in some no, ways. No, it's a real it thing. It does feel good, right? No, 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 no. No doubt about yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that goes to the point about it's not just movement, it's controlled, purposeful movement. And yes. Sometimes that can be fast like a cheetah, and sometimes that movement can be slow and breathing. So still. Yeah. yeah. All right. Love you, friends. Thank you so much yeah. for coming. Thank you again, you Daniela. Week. Very nice. And we'll see you guys soon.